I just wanted to start the panel off by just letting each one of you uh, take a quick stab at uh, giving the group here uh, your, your three minutes of advice on if, if uh, somebody here has to uh, run out and describe what's going on on a particular fire, uh, what advice would you uh, give folks on, on uh, how they ought to approach that task of, of going out to the public to talk about uh, activities that we're taking on a particular fire. So, how about let's start with the uh, far left there. With far the, left. <laughs> with Jim. Uh, 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 right. I saw how that worked out, huh? Yeah. I think we're all to the left. <laughs> well, you know, I I get so inspired coming to these events because I learn so much from friends and colleagues. I have no idea what you're up to till you know coming together. And, uh, you know, I can't fill up a, a, a legal pad with notes and, and my head's swimming with ideas, but I wonder, will they ever get beyond the walls of this room and how? And th that's just, we got to keep that foremost in mind. We need to build that social license or support for ecological fire management. I think we're fully capable of, of making the case, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, we, we just might need to start reaching out and getting more social scientists, more educators, communicators, get, you know, enlist them uh, to, to, to make that case. I like how the Park Service, with its fire information, they always dial in fire ecology education. Even if it's boilerplate, stick it in. It's, it's always there and they, they take that opportunity to do that. Every wildfire is a teachable moment to talk about fire ecology. And, and uh, you know, Sarah's right, there's a lot more public support for restoring fire, restoring ecosystems, being safe, uh, and that, uh, we, that, you know, we're, we're just being uh, limited by old assumptions uh, that uh, are holding us back. So I don't know if that made sense, but that's my advice. How, think beyond this box and how do we get what we're doing out there to the public. Uh, just real quick, uh, you guys in the here in the back, or we need to move the microphone around? We're good, okay, Nate. Yeah, I guess it came down to, and it comes down to what I was talking about, is <clears throat> really you need to clear objectives. And with those objectives, <clears throat> you need to be willing to communicate it to the public and accept, have that transparency and accept <coughs> the pushback or the understanding or the difficulties that come with that. But also, if you're going to do that, you need your prep work up front. You, you need to be having that enge engagement with your local community, um, providing access to, uh, access to information, explaining what you're trying to do in areas where you may be achieving ecological benefits, your management approach. You need to consistently do that. And there's, there's sort of that dichotomy there where often at the incident, you know, you have the different social media, Facebook, and actually some of the incident, the incident management teams have become very sophisticated in using that. But I think you still got to tie it back to your objectives. Uh, one thing that really impressed me this year in Yellowstone, we had 65,000 acres that burned. Um, and some of that, those fires actually disrupted visitation right along roads. Uh, we did a lot of public information. There was clear communication on the website. Uh, but that information was there before the fire. I talked about their fire management program. I talked about the history of their fire management program. I talked about the 88 burns. I talked about past management strategies and approaches uh, in a very quick and easy way, interesting way to read it. And that's what's important. And then also during that, uh, Yellowstone is very good at having public information officers really engaging and talking about it. One thing I didn't point out in that uh, uh, in my presentation where I was looking at NC Web and Yellowstone fires, one of the things that uh, the Maple Fire had up on NC Web was one of the things they were interested in was how fires reburn in the 88 fires. So Yellowstone is also willing to go out and talk about the science and find out and, and make it public. But when you're talking about a suppression fire where you're, uh, you have uh, values at risk, how is this potential being lost? You know, you communicate it in one way. As the incident changes and opportunity occurs, you need to communicate it the other way and adjust your objectives to that. That's what I'd recommend. Okay, Tim? 
so again, I guess I can't emphasize too much the need to talk about specific ecological things that the fire is going to do, um, specific improvements uh, that uh, the outcome of the fire will achieve, uh, rather than talking generically about fire use or ecological fire use. I mean, that's a, those are great terms that we can talk about in general, but when you're on a fire, when you're managing a fire on your unit, when you are associated with a fire on a unit, a specific fire, talk about the specific things that that fire is going to do so that the public really understands it. Uh, not, it's not just the public, it's some of your own internal uh, co-workers also don't understand and need to understand. So don't just assume that those folks you work with are completely on board and, and understand completely what that particular fire might be doing. Uh, so again, be very specific at, or specific as you can. It's easy when a fire is in a wilderness area to say we're just not intervening in a natural process and that's that's good and that's the right thing but there are also many things that that fire in a wilderness does that uh, the public will understand if you explain that to them. Uh, and the converse, uh, what happens when fire is excluded in a wilderness? Uh, you can talk about that too. So again, the more specific you can talk about it, the more the public, uh, cooperators, stakeholders will get on board and uh, and support those actions. Uh, you know, the, in many of our wilderness areas, uh, fire playing across the landscape uh, uh, improves habitat for big game. And a lot of folks that might ne necessarily be supportive of other aspects of, of forest service or public land management really get behind that. So uh, again, um, I can't emphasize enough to be as specific as you can about what this particular fire is achieving. And, and also to Make sure you don't forget your coworkers and the other employees that you work with that also talk to their neighbors and other and people ask them, you know, what's going on out there. If they can't talk about it um, in a meaningful way, then uh, that's half the audience that we're, we're losing by not having our own folks uh, understand and articulate those uh, those messages. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions from both. So, yeah. Take first track. Well, uh, uh, land management planning is, is one thing, and we're uh, in a round of that, and Frankie can probably talk more specifically about that, but uh, that's an opportunity there, uh, and, and spatial fire management planning that's associated with that. Uh, one of the things that um, contributed to a reduction in the use of fire, opportunistic use of fire, is uh, the Jim Hubbard letter of 2012. And I've talked to Jim a number of times about that. He wished he could take that letter back because it had unintended long-term consequences. So, uh, and the letter for folks that aren't familiar with it, uh, suspended uh, opportunistic use of wildfire, one way of calling that, wildland fire use, PNF, whatever you want to call it, um, suspended it for uh, at least a portion of the 2012 fire season. Line officers got a clear message that they had no um, political support, internal political support, if they chose to manage a fire for resource benefit that year, and that stuck with them for a while. And it still hasn't gone away in many areas. What it takes is the chief to come out and regional foresters to come out to support this. And the chief's le letter for the fire season last year, this last, or this year, actually addressed that uh, in a way that uh, provided folks with enough information, enough uh, confidence that the chief had their back, that they could uh, move forward. This region, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in my talk this afternoon, has a great regional forester and a great uh, fire director who have uh, strongly supported the use of fire. And, 
and it uh, shows in the accomplishment that many of the forests have, uh, have uh, shown this year in uh, um, using fire for resource benefit. So I think it starts at the leadership level, at the chief's level, cascades down to regional foresters, forest supervisors, and so on. And uh, anywhere in that chain, it can be broken and then things don't happen. I don't know if that addressed your question. And, and so uh, I'll just touch on this one a little bit. I think we've got to mistrust our accounting systems uh, a little bit because uh, I think what we saw when you said we reduced uh, those acres burned, it's because we changed our accounting system from counting all those acres from those fires where uh, pursuit of those resource objectives were number one and that was the driving factor. But you think all the other fires, we didn't have it at all. I think today we have more fires out there where uh, looking at ecological benefits is part of the overall scheme, but it may not be the driver. Our county system can't really factor that in. So I, I think we've got to be careful about saying we're, we're tanking because I don't see that happening. Up in the back there. Yeah, I just uh, want to ask a question about communications and uh, trying to communicate on wildfire abuse during the wildfire season has been one of my biggest challenges. I've only succeeded a handful of times in over a decade. And I'm wondering if the panel has any recommendations on communication strategy, what appears to be working, particularly in fire season when you're doing wildfire abuse and you're not getting the sensationalized reporting from CNN, but what about sensationalized reporting on, wow, this is a great fire, it's restoring the landscape. Now, how do you get that across the I'll, I'll take a try. That's not my expertise, but what I saw in the Yellowstone fires, I mean, these were active fires during the peak of visitation in Yellowstone National Park. And they were effective in communicating the message and effective in, in dealing with, um, no, they, they were effective in communicating uh, the message to the public, to the visitors and a broader public and a community. One of the fires was near West Yellowstone. Uh, they had a good social media presence. Uh, they were clear with their message. They weren't calling it wildland fire use. They were, like Tim was saying, they were specific in the objectives. It's a wildfire that had multiple objectives. And some of the objectives they had to deal with related to public community, or the adjacent communities. Some of the objectives had to deal with uh, ecological benefits. And they, they communicated and they invested in that presence to inform, you know, to make sure that communications were occurring. They had a number of PIOs in the park dealing with that, and that, that made it effective. Anybody else want to try that one? Or? Yeah, many people said it's, it's uh, you know, investing in communication before the first whiff of smoke will pay off, hopefully, when fire is burning, and that's, we, we got to think proactively about that kind of education. But, uh, you know, it, it's hard to, to list all the objectives and all that when you may get nine second sound bite on the evening news. And so how do we, we really got to craft our words very, you know, wisely, very artfully, and that's going to be hard. We can say, well, we're, we're, we're managing the fire to maximize its benefits in the wilderness so we can be very selective, strategic with our firefighters protecting your homes. That might get caught on the news. And I think people will, you know, give it a trade off. Sure, protect my home. Oh, and it's a good thing that the fires burn in the wilderness. That's, you know, so, I, you know, it's, it's just, uh, we, we got to put energy into it. Definitely, communication. So I think we have several more hands. We're going to try to hit as many as we can, Tim. Yeah, I have a, so part of the communication and the, the vocabulary piece is, so I was just looking up the ICS 209, and that's the mechanism we use to report what we're doing on our fires. So if you're a plants chief or if you're just a local type 3 IC and you have to fill this form out, you get four choices. You get monitor, confine, point your zone protection, and full suppression. Those are your options. So. If you're, you know, we know the media grabs onto these things. This goes into the incident or uh, the SIP report, and anyone can grab that and then it gets stuck into NC Web. So to me, this is one of the problems we have. Is I love the idea of describing our objectives and what we want to do, 
But when we report our fires, we don't get that option. Yeah. So, and this is the mechanism that's used to communicate with the media, the public, and internally, and how resources are allocated. So if I pick, I'm going to pick a confined strategy on my fire, then that gets rolled up to, to Nick and to Nipsey, and now I need resources to help me implement my strategy. Well, it's not, you didn't pick full suppression, so you don't get resources. So those are going to go to the fires that pick full suppression. So I feel like we have a giant problem with our own way we communicate and report and, then, and select a quote strategy and how then the fire commander subs. We need to eliminate the 209. <laughs> it's a pack of lies, and you can generate all that information through other means and uh, then avoid that misperception that many blocks in the 209 provide. That's my suggestion now, uh, Oh, I'm not sure they're going to jump on that right away. <laughs> I think what Dave was presenting is, is really key. Like, if, why are we putting more resources where they're least effective? It's an exercise in futility, and it's, you know, we're bankrupting our, ourselves doing it. We should be putting the resources where they're most effective. Maybe we need to flip fire severity, or uh, what's it called, severity uh, staffing entirely, where the regions are going to be hot and it's inhumanly possible to stop them. Okay, back off, but where we can get a lot of good fire on the ground because the climate change or climate conditions are good, that's where we put them. I, I don't know, but. Uh, why can you not manage a fire for resource benefits because you lack resources? So you got to call a suppression to get resources? That is twisted. So we're going to try to get another... I, I just had a follow-up comment to that real quick. Uh, uh, 209s are delivered to uh, regional uh, multi-agency coordinating groups. Some of those groups are very sophisticated, mature, and understand. And in the southern region I visited there uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, largest uh, fire managed for resource benefit in southern region history on the Cahuta uh, Wilderness Area in northern Georgia, o uh, Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest. That fire, everybody knew, was being managed for resource benefit. They had a Type 2 team on it, all the resources they needed, despite the fact that uh, hundreds of fires were burning across the south and uh, resources were in short supply. So it doesn't have to be that way. It's up to those regional multi-agency coordinating groups to understand and provide those resources. So the panel, how do we incentivize the IMPAT change to make that want to embrace using fire? And the second part of that, do you think that will influence our practitioners on the ground to also embrace that, our division suits, hotshot superintendents, and two bosses? Well, let me talk about that just a little bit. Uh, Incident management teams, again, are managed by geographic area coordinating groups. Each region manages those, and so the national office, or at the national level, you can't develop a program to incentivize those effectively because the geographic areas manage those. And so it's up to GAC by GAC to do that. And uh, I'm, uh, I don't have a solution, but it has to reside at the GAC level. I, I have a painful process. Uh, and that is at the land management unit level and the delegation authority and the objectives that are being defined, that is demand of the team. And the team has to reach and work with the land management unit to reach those objectives. And somehow the teams need to adjust the fact that fires and what they're asked to do is going to vary. It's not necessarily a specialization of fire use teams versus uh, incident management or suppression-based teams, because otherwise we're going to keep this dichotomy. And incident, incidents are dynamic, and we should have different approaches to how we deal with those incidents, and those teams need to have that flexibility. And that's painful, and it might be idealistic, um, but at that ground level, at, at the Grand Canyon, when you bring someone in to manage your, your fire, the fuller fire, you may have issues with that team, and a lot of times they have issues with all teams. A lot of times they do good jobs, but we still have issues. But that's what we got to start demanding of them, and that's the best we can do. And I think we need to get fire ecology curriculum integrated right from the start in basic firefighter training and work up the chain of command at every level. And that's, you know, an investment. Well, 
Folks, I think we are probably at the break.